to take a look into surgical ergonomics and see what we do and don't do in the operating room. I have no disclosures, no disclaimers. So why did I choose this topic? I'm not an expert by any means, but I like to operate and although I have bad posture at baseline, I probably don't exercise enough, I've already experienced back pain and neuropathies from being in the operating room and I just know that I'm doing something wrong. So today we have a few objectives. Um, we're gonna first go over the history of ergonomics um, and then we'll see uh, how we can apply ergonomics in surgery, mostly focusing on laparoscopy and then just touching a little bit on robotic surgery. And then just again, touching a little bit on the future of surgical ergonomics. So what exactly is ergonomics? Well, it's the engineering of human factors, and it comes from the Greek word ergon, meaning labor, and nomos, meaning law. It's essentially the scientific study of people at work in a systems approach to improve accuracy, productivity, training, satisfaction, and safety. <clears throat> so in industry, um, we look at how man interfaces with machine. It's a little different in the operating room, though, because we're looking at man versus machine versus another man being the patient. So ergonomics. It can be broken down into three basic divisions. There's the physical aspect, the cognitive aspect, and then the organizational aspect, more at the process and systems level. Today, we'll be focusing more on the physical aspect, um, just on anatomy and how surgeons move in the operating room and how we can better uh, those motions. And inherently, we'll touch also upon some of the cognitive aspects with motor response and perception. So the scientific management principle is most closely associated with Frederick Taylor, and this is sort of the start of modern ergonomics. His method was to really study time and how people were efficient with their time usage. His favorite example to give was when he was studying 75 workers at a Bethlehem steel factory where they would shovel pig iron all day long. And he thought that they could increase their productivity. So he picked a worker and he told him that they wanted no back talk. And when your manager tells you to walk, you walk. And when he tells you to sit down, you sit down. And when they did that um, and they improved or they did what their managers told them to do, um, they found that the worker improved their productivity by shoveling uh, 47 tons of pig iron versus just 12, which is what they had been um, shoveling before, and it increased their daily pay from like $1.15 to $1.85. Um, the next sort of pioneer and industrial engineer involved with ergonomics is Frank Gilbreth. Um, he is probably most well known for being not only a industrial engineer and a pioneer in ergonomics, but he had 12 kids and the movie Cheaper by the Dozen is very loosely, loosely based on his family. Um, but his first job was in World War I. Uh, it was his job to uh, figure out a more efficient way to assemble and disassemble small arms. And he pretty much broke down each hand motion to a combination of some 17 hand movements and used a motor pic motion picture camera to um, improve productivity. Um, in 1915, 1916, he decided that he wanted to observe hospital efficiency. His wife was also an industrial engineer and a psychologist. And so they had some interest in the medical field. Um, he anticipated that because of the high degree of training and education and the importance of the work in the operating room, that he would find the perfection of efficiency and methodology there. He said, the surgeon is the most interesting of all mechanics, the motions that he makes being the most delicate, the most important, and the most far-reaching in their importance. Unfortunately, he was sorely disappointed, and he found that there was waste unparalleled in his prior experience that went on in the hospitals. Um, he found that surgeons could learn more about motion study, time study, waste elimination, and scientific management from industries than the industries could learn from the hospitals. He observed that surgeons spent more time looking for instruments rather than actually operating. 
And he was the one that who first came up with this idea of having a surgical caddy to organize instrument trays and to hand the surgeon what they needed for the operation. He presented this data to the American Medical Association in 1915 or 1916. Um, but they did not accept this until 1930, the 1930s and actually put it into practice. So moving forward, um, there was a sort of a lull in ergonomic research, especially in the medical field um, in the mid-1900s. Um, there was a surgeon named Dr. Frank, Franklin McCarty in Chicago who did put out a paper about motion study and surgery and how it's more effectively organized, you know, where anesthesia stands versus the operating room table versus um, where the like, Mayo and the instrument tables all stand. Um, and then there was a little bit more interest that came about in the 60s with the advent of microsurgery and cardiopulmonary bypass. But really, ergonomics didn't come into the light again until the advent of lapar or the popularization of laparoscopic surgery in the 80s and 90s, and then more so in the 2000s with robotic surgery. So why does it even matter? So ergonomics is so important in developing new surgical techniques, instruments, and training methods. It, can, it definitely involves patient safety. I think the FDA reported 1.3 million patient injuries due to um, ill-produced uh, pro uh, medical um, equipment. And it's also important for the surgeon well-being and sustainability, which in effect can also and does affect patient safety. So what are the benefits of surgical ergonomics? You have increased, you can get increased productivity, reduction in errors, reduction in injury and illness, reduction in missed work, and reduction in personal turnover. What happens with poor ergonomics, you get this excessive wear and tear on your tendons, muscles, and nerves by continuous use over an extended period of time. Um, and this is all due to improper work positioning, position, uh, positioning, repetition, and force. So what's the problem? The problem is, is that we're in a culture where we adapt the worker to the environment, so the surgeon to the operating room, rather than adapting the environment to the worker. Um, initially, when operating rooms and instruments were being designed, they were fo focusing more on how to safely administer anesthesia and how to maintain sterility, which is totally valid. Um, so that was the main driving factor then. With the advent of laparoscopy, most of the first generation laparoscopic instruments came from ENT instruments that were just sort of hastily modified to just get the job done in laparoscopy. So not a lot of attention to ergonomics and how um, the surgeon can most optimally use the instruments. Another big issue is just plain unawareness. Um, just people just are not aware of what sort of ergonomic guidelines are already out there and <clears throat> uh, they just don't know. Um, there's resistance to change. There's a surgeon fostered, you know, culture that they just provide self, they self-sacrifice to take care of their patients and are just sort of indifferent to taking care of themselves. Um, and it's just, quote unquote, part of the job. So there's a current surgeon and advocate for ergonomics, Dr. Adrian Park, who says surgeons are not one to hold back on their complaints, but when it comes to our own health, we are slow to act. We turn our bodies into pretzels for the best outcome of the patient, and this strenuous activity is just not sustainable. So what's wrong with these pictures? There's first one here. Why is her head turned around to look at this monitor when there's this monitor right there that they could just turn on? Um, this surgeon is retracting away from himself. That's not ergonomic. This surgeon could probably benefit from raising the table up. Um, his neck is way too flexed. And then these surgeons here, their shoulders are way too far out and up, and it's just not a comfortable position to maintain. So there was a study in the Journal of American College of Surgeons this year, um, which cited that various surveys in the past have reported anywhere from 20 to 100% of surgeons with occupational symptoms. In the past, about 40% in various studies um, have reported more than one injury, 22% missed work, and about a third had to reduce their caseload to recover from their injuries. Again, this is a picture of surgical oncologists actually at work here. And although this is very uh, unergonomic, it's something that we've all seen and probably have done. So this was a survey given out to 219 surgeons, and 127 responded. 
and 94% had at least one occupational symptom in the last six weeks, mostly complaining of neck pain, back pain, stiffness, just general fatigue and physical discomfort from being in the operating room. The most common problems being C-spine pain, um, just lower back pain, um, peripheral neuropathies, carpal tunnel, and just generalized musculoskeletal fatigue. Another survey done back in 2010, where an email survey was sent out to 2,000 active GI and endoscopic surgeon members of SAGES, um, had 370, 317 participants who responded, and 87% re reported some physical discomfort or symptom attributed to minimally invasive surgery. So the demographics for this survey, the average age of the surgeon was about 44, mostly males, right-handed, um, their mean annual case volume about 200. They've been operating on average for 10 years. Um, here, the yellow, it's uh, peop the incidence or the complaint of left hand pain, the pink being right hand, um, neck pain, back pain, lower extremity pain. And when asked how much they were aware of ergonomics, most of them were not very aware at all. There was a very low percentage, about 10%, who felt that they had any sort of ergonomic knowledge. So what were the common complaints? Well, instrument design, operating room table setup, display monitor locations, and the type of display system that their ORs used. There were some protective and some negative risk factors associated with the symptoms that people complained of. The most protective factor being just awareness, just knowing and just being more aware of how your body is in the OR. Um, exercise was protective. Greater number of years in practice and actually increasing age were protective factors because I believe as you just get older and progress into your career, you just become more aware of not only your physical ailments, but just, just wanting to be more mindful of that. <clears throat> Increased injury and pain were associated more with higher caseload. Um, being a woman, being shorter, having a smaller glove size, often because your, the instruments don't fit your hand, um, just things don't fit right. Um, and also those who practiced hand-assisted lap techniques because now you're sort of trying to find the balance between laparoscopy and an open operation, sort of. So how do surgeons cope? Well, about 30% said that they would change their instrument, take a break. Um, some um, just would change their posture, but a whopping 40% just ignored it. They just ignored the problem. 67% um, looked for and had to receive treatment that included physical and occupational therapy. They looked towards complementary medicine. Some needed an operation. Um, and only about 40% made any sort of modification to their practice as a result of all this. So again, laparoscopy is sort of when um, ergonomics, the subject of ergonomics became more popular. Um, what happens? So there's a difference between la open and laparos laparoscopy, and we'll discuss those here. So in lapar laparoscopic surgery, you lose that tactile sensation because of the instruments you have to lose. You lose that feedback. You have decreased degrees of, degrees of freedom. So you go from having 20 plus degrees of freedom in an open operation to about four being rotation, up, down, left, right, and in and out movement from the patient's body. You go from 3D vision to two-dimensional vision. You get this binocular effect. You lose that peripheral vision when you're looking inside the patient's abdomen. And you're having to work in separate coordinate systems. So your visual access is separate from your motor access. So that's another cognitive challenge that you have to overcome. And you get this fulcrum effect. So when your hand moves right, your instrument in the body moves left. So that's another thing that's different. And when you're doing laparoscopy, you're posture is more, more static than when you're doing an open operation. And finally, there's just more clutter, more cords on the operating field. Um, there was a study that showed that um, laparoscopic machinery and instruments, they take up 10% more floor space in the operating room. So there have been multiple studies that have been done looking at ergonomics of surgeons um, in laparoscopy versus open surgery. Keeping in mind that most of these surgeons, most of these studies involve putting probes and sensors on patients and using EMG to sort of monitor muscle contraction and things like that. Um, so it's very cumbersome. 
And then when surgeons are being monitored or watched, you have to be aware of this thing called the Hawthorne effect, where um, you tend to sort of be more cautious and maybe perform a little bit better knowing that you're watched. So you have to keep these things in mind when you read about these sort of studies. So in open surgery, what do they find in these studies? Your neck tends to be more flexed. You have more lateral neck flexion during an open operation. Your trunk tends to be flexed more, so more of that back bent uh, position. Your right shoulder tends to be more flexed, and, but you do tend to shift your weight more in open surgeries. Whereas in laparoscopy, your neck tends to be more extended because of improper monitor positioning. You're in a more upright and static posture. Um, using those instruments requires your shoulders to be more abducted and internally rotated. Your left shoulder tends to be in flexion more because of how it's retracting or assisting your other hand. Um, your elbows tend to be in more flexion, your wrists supinated more, you get more radial and ulnar deviation, and you require more finger force to operate the instruments compared to the regular instruments you used in an open operation. So another study was done, a survey, seeing how many surgeons actually applied any sort of ergonomic guidelines in minimally invasive surgery. It was a survey sent out to 284 surgeons in Europe, and most agreed that they had discomfort due to either non-ergonomic table height, bad monitor position and height, and a small percentage complained of the use of the foot pedal, agreeing that it caused discomfort. So again, this surgeon, his arms are way too high. It's sort of known as the chicken wing posture, and you can get laparoscopic shoulder and pain from that. His neck is way too rotated. His monitor should be in front of him. Again, causing, it can cause neck pain and discomfort. So about 80% in this survey had some sort of physical complaint. And 100% said ergonomics are definitely important in the operating room. But only 11% were aware of any sort of ergonomic guidelines regarding equipment, apparatus, and posture that were out there. So these are ideal sort of positions that you want to be in, although it's hard when you're actively trying to do things in the operating room. Sorry, this text is small. But your neck shouldn't be flexed more than about 10 to 30 degrees. You shouldn't have to rotate your neck more than about 15 degrees. Your shoulders shouldn't have to be abducted more than 30 degrees. Um, your shoulders shouldn't be up to your ears. You should remember to drop your shoulders. They should be at a comfortable level. Um, your instruments should be at less than a 45 degree angle from the horizontal. There should be about a 90 to 120 degree um, difference or angle between your forearm and your upper arm. You should just try to maintain a neutral position as much as possible um, and shouldn't have to do these dramatic wrist movements. Um, your feet should be about hips width apart and try not to keep all your weight on one leg. Shift your weight around, don't lock your knees and use more of your trunk and pelvic muscles rather than using your back and just try to avoid the static position. So when you're in a static position for a really long time, you have this prolonged muscle contraction. It can decrease muscle perfusion and nutrient flow and decrease removal of lactic acid and waste products and that can cause muscle fatigue. We've all felt it. Um, optimal table height. So there's a lot of variables when it comes to optimal table height. Uh, patient girth, the surgeon's height, type of laparoscopic instrument you're using. But in general, it's agreed upon that the table should be definitely lower than what it is in open surgery. The instrument handles should be either at elbow level or 10 centimeters be below elbow height. Image display. So we've come a ways coming from this sort of display where it's sitting on top of this unadjustable cart to having ceiling suspended monitors where you have more flexibility in positioning the monitor, um, especially in regards to height. Um, it should definitely be in line with the surgeon's view. So some studies have shown that this has shown to be an independent uh, factor in reducing procedure time. I think there was a study that showed a decrease in six minutes in doing a lab appy if you just, by just moving the monitor right in front of the surgeon. It can also cause eye strain. So two factors and, um, for this. So how far away the monitor is from the observer and then how high the monitor is relative to, relative to the surgeon's eye height. 
What happens is your eyes have to converge and accommodate, and you get prolonged contraction of the extraocular and ciliary muscles, and it just causes fatigue and eye strain. So when you look at the human eye in its orbit and the neutral orientation, it's naturally at an inclined angle of 15 degrees. Accommodation of the unrefracted human eye is on average about 0.8 meters, and the average conversion distance is about one meter. So what is the optimal image display? It should be in a neutral position. It should be straight in front of the surgeon. It should be in line with the forearm instrument motor axis and about 15 degrees below eye level so that you can have this gaze down viewing. The distance on average anywhere from 80 to 120 centimeters, but this can vary depending on monitor size and the type. And this can be hard to implement in the operating room. Um, so you just have to find a balance between being effective and efficient uh, and being safe. So this is just a visual in the horizontal plane for A. Um, not having to move more than 15 degrees in that um, plane to work and look at the monitor and then B showing the sort of 15 degrees down, gaze down viewing um, for the monitor as well. Now, a little bit about instrument handles. So you have three functional zones of the hand. You have your grasp, which is your thumb being opposed to any of your second to fifth fingers. You have your dynamic and precise grasp where you use your index finger, which is highly mobile with your middle finger and your thumb. So you get really precise grasp with that. And then you have your power grip where you bring in your ring finger and your pinky. And that's more static, but it allows you to hold things um, more strongly. So these functional zones of the hand can translate over to three basic grips, the contact grip, seizing, and encircling. So what does that mean? So contact is any sort of contact between your hand and an object, like carrying a tray or ringing a doorbell. Seizing is using your fingers to grab keys or use tweezers. Encircling is having to use all of your fingers um, to hold a hammer, and that can provide some moderate accuracy when you're using it. So how does this translate to laparoscopy and using those instruments? So the contact grip, having to push buttons on a suction irrigator, using the cog wheel to rotate the instrument, um, use, pushing the button for cautery. The seizing grip um, is used to open and close the instrument, the effector. And the encircling grip is just to be able to hold the instrument. So these are the most sensitive areas of your hand, at the fingertips and then at the thin arm. And so ideally, that's where um, you would like to be able to uh, manipulate your, the instrument to get the maximal feedback and the maximal sensitivity. Other issues, you have a fixed point of entry with the trocar, and you have a lower handle to tip force transmission ratio. So you have to push a lot harder to accomplish what you want to do with a laparoscopic instrument versus um, in an open operation. So in general, it just requires more force and more wrist deviation. So principles for laparoscopic instruments. And as you um, read these, just think about how, how much of these are actually applied to the instruments you use on a daily basis. So the handle should allow several functions to be performed. It must be adjustable for various hand sizes. It should be as small as possible. It should allow one-handed use. It should be, the function should be ascertainable just from the handle's design. The functional elements must be designed to prevent pressure areas and possibilities for injury. Functional elements should be operated by the sensitive areas of the hand. Keeps going. Functional elements must be easily accessible. The size and dimension should allow easy manipulation. Any necessary springs should function adequately and not hinder use. Um, you should avoid indirect power transmission have minimal autonomous dynamics that can uh, create artificial movements, and it should allow or not, um, it should allow for comfortable positions and not uh, to be in a cramped position with excessive shoulder movements. And then the instrument's shaft should be really an extension of your forearm's rotation axis. So these are sort of the basic instrument handles that we have. You have your ring handle and your shank handle, and they can either be at an angle to the shaft or in line with the shaft. You also have the pistol handle. And then this endo hand is more of a glove, but it's only really applicable to virtual reality situations. So we don't really, it doesn't apply to us as much. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> um, so a little bit more about the ring handle. So in order to have the axis of the shaft 
match the axis of your forearm, it requires your wrist to be flexed and abducted radially. And you can't really rotate it very well just by using your forearm. You'd have to use more shoulder abduction and adduction to rotate. Um, this inline ring handle creates you or causes you to have more ulnar deviation and more shoulder movement as well, so not super ergonomic. The shank handle, in order for that to be in line with your forearm axis, requires a little bit of dorsal extension of the wrist, but you can rotate this more with pronation and supination rather than having to use those bigger shoulder movements. And again, the inline version of the handle requires more ulnar deviation and shoulder movement compared to the one at the ankle. So this picture shows what the contact zones are between the ring handle and the shank handle to the hand. So the top one being the ring handle and the, sec the bottom picture being the shank handle. Um, you can see with the ring handle, you have these smaller, more narrow pressure areas um, versus the shank where you have a broader contact zone across the hand. Um, so for these ring handles with this more narrow pressure area, it can create more um, potential for injury, pain, neuropathies. Uh, but you can see with both of these instruments, um, the, they don't contact the most sensitive areas of the hand, which are at the fingertips. I've had this problem where I can't even reach the cogwheel on an instrument. Um, the pistol handle. The pistol handle is great in that it allows for additional functions like coagulation, suction, etc., and it eliminates the need for a foot switch. But it's expensive, and oftentimes construction capability and manufacturer capability overrides the need for the surgeon in ergonomics. Um, and so it oftentimes isn't very ergonomic at all. And the way they make up for this is each instrument is a single use instrument only. Oops. So a little bit about robotic surgery. There are some benefits to robotic surgery compared to laparoscopy. You get motion scaling, so the big motions of the hand get translated to these smaller motions inside the abdomen. Um, you have tremor reduction, you get improved visualization, more dexterity, I think you get like an extra degree of freedom. Um, and ideally, an ergonomic workstation. There was a survey done to see though what sort of discomfort people complained about in robotic surgery. Um, almost 20,000 online surveys were sent out to participants of the Intuitive Robotic Surgery course within the past 11 years. About 1,400 surgeons responded, but only 1,200 were included because they had experience in all three modalities of surgery, open laparoscopy and robotic. Sorry, this is kind of small. Um, so you can see here, um, average age, you know, 45 for the surgeon. It gives a little bit about their build and then their practice length. So most of them have been doing open surgery for about 14 years, laparoscopy for about 12 years, robotic surgery for about three years. Um, and then 68% complained of some discomfort. And out of that 68%, um, only about 8% attributed that to a robotic case. So this again just shows the incidence of complaints across um, open laparoscopy and robotic surgery while performing the surgery immediately after and chronically or persistently after surgery. Um, robotic appearing to have the least amount of complaints. And what else was interesting was that about a third of the surgeons took into consideration the modality of the operation um, when um, trying to decide what to do for the patient. So that doesn't mean that the surgeon is putting their own health on top of above the patient, but that really surgeon comfort is becoming a more driving factor for a more ergonomic operating room. In robotic surgery, uh, surgeons tend to have more eye or finger uh, symptoms than in open or laparoscopic surgery, and they're more likely to have thumb symptoms compared to open surgery, but not necessarily to laparoscopic. Um, about 8% of these surgeons reported needing injury or reporting requiring treatment for um, injury, 8% in laparoscopic, 6% in open, and 3% in robotic. Um, there was another survey mostly responded to by gynecologists um, using the robot um, with a mean average of 115 robotic cases, having practiced for about five years. And they, again, complain mostly of neck stiffness, finger fatigue, um, upper and lower back pain, 
but their complaints were mostly about the microphone and speaker system and the pedal design. So stretching is important. It can give us a little breather, a little refresher. So I found this very interesting. Targeted stretching micro breaks. So there was another multi-center cohort study done by Dr. Adrian Park, and he looked at surgeons doing all three modalities of surgery and evaluated their pain and fatigue. There were 66 participants, average age about 47, mean BMI 26, average glove size seven, mostly men, and 80% exercise more than four times a week. Again, they complained mostly of neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, some leg pain. And they said that it affected their posture, their stamina, their mobility, and their concentration. And so what did they do to counteract this? Well, most people just changed their position. They changed um, the surgical field somehow. They took a break. And some still just ignored it. So what exactly are targeted stretching micro breaks? There are these little exercises that are designed to be done within 120 seconds, about every 20 to 40 minutes or whenever appropriate, while maintaining sterility during a case. They target the neck, the shoulders, the upper back, the lower back, wrists, hands, knees, and ankles. And there are these five standard exercises that they created. So what exactly were they? Oops, oh no, all my pictures are cut off. Um, but it was, you can kind of get a, the gist of it. Okay, I don't know what happened to those. Little shoulder neck rotation. Okay, sorry. Little arm extension. And then they were exercising their trunk, bending forward. And then they were doing some foot exercises. Um, so, <laughs> yo, you've been demonstrating. Um, so then they asked, them to evaluate their pain before and after doing these exercises. So they would do a case without the exercises and then they would do a similar case at a later date using the exercises within the operation. And a lot of people um, said that they had improvement in their neck pain, their wrist pain, their shoulder pain, et cetera. So there seemed to be some improvement. Um, they didn't find any difference in benefit between open and laparoscopy. All surgeons sort of seemed to benefit equally. Um, about half perceived improvements in their physical performance, 38% related improved mental focus, and about 87% said, yeah, they want to incorporate this into their operating room. So Dr. Ramon Berger is sort of another um, pioneer and advocate for ergonomics, who was actually, I think, a professor here said, in developing specific ergonomic standards for the operating room, we must depart from the current concept of the operating room as a shell into which people and devices are placed. Instead, the operating room of the future must be conceived from the beginning around the task at hand and integrate electrical power, gases, communication, video, data display, and other necessities in such a way that they enhance and not interfere with the work of the surgical team. So when I told Dr. Mintakis down at South Sacramento that I was doing this topic, she told me this story. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a clamp on her head. During her residency, one of her junior residents was operating, and she went in to periodically check on them to make sure they were doing OK. And the attending kept getting on to the resident because they were so hunched over all the time. And he was threatening to put a clamp on their head if she didn't straighten up. So the next time Dr. Mintakis went in there, of course, the resident had a clamp on their head and had to finish the case like that. So residents, beware, not necessarily of attendings putting instruments on your head, but just be aware of your body positioning and just develop good habits early. So future direction. I think the biggest thing is increasing awareness. There just seems to be a lack of knowledge or just a lack of, yeah, just a lack of awareness. Um, and having to apply the current guidelines is in itself very important. There's still a lot to be, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but the fact that we don't even apply what we sort of already know now is um, just very telling. So I think advancement of ergonomics, even as a surgical science in itself, is very important and crucial in designing future instrument and operating room design. These are some of the things that are out there right now. So yeah, this guy, he's operating and on this chair, the ethos chair, and it's on top of the patient's head, and he's doing some sort of pelvic surgery. So I don't know how anesthesia is doing anything, but that's this current prototype. Um, this display, this is a 
a head display um, that provides 3D visualization during a laparoscopic case. And I wondered how can they see anything outside of the head display, but apparently there's this, you can look down here and see the actual field. And then there's this innovative design that came out of University of Michigan, um, this instrument called the FlexDex, um, where the instrument tip actually rotates and moves around according to how your wrist is rotating. Um, and they're actually starting to sell and use those now in the operating room. So it's been said that a man who will not consider change is an old man. So just keep an open mind. <laughs> demonstrate the micro <laughs> exercises. It's very simple, a little head, neck flexion, a little side to side, you know, up and down. I think we should very all be doing it. That was great, really great, and I think, you know, relevant to absolutely every single person in this room. That this is what we do every day, and we do it, we do it every day, we do it several times a week, we're bad in the clinic, we do procedures. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing to me that surgeons actually haven't been more proactive about making this yeah. part of what we do. And it does interfere with productivity and it does affect all these things. So we have some time for questions. It yeah. seems like you have to step back and look at the whole room and the surgeon can't do that sometimes. Because <laughs> we get so focused in the case that you know we're going to trudge on and get the case done and hurt ourselves. So it should be a systems change where nursing staff, other staff in the room can eyeball, look at the, like the pictures you showed and say, hey, there are suggestions in the group. Or to suggest take the breaks and stretch it. Right, and there's a lot of ergonomic studies and research just focusing on nursing care and um, the nurses in the operating room and in the hospital. So it's definitely... And nurses have been more proactive with respect to their unions and other things mm -hmm. around certain requirements related to their ergonomics that, yeah, that doctors definitely. have not. Yes, Ellie. As somebody else who has some trouble operating some of the laparoscopic instruments from the hand side, what is coming down the pipe as far as... Like, you know, in reality, in terms of instrument design, I don't know what's going on, if anything at all. We just, we now, we know the problem, but no one seems to want to do anything about it. So there's a little bit in Covidian, actually. So there, Covidian has um, some women representatives who have talked about, and it's, it's men and women of different sizes, but the increase in women into the field is what started the conversation, but around some of the uh, specific issues related to hand size. Yes. Lately, you know, there's a lot more going on in hybrid rooms and wearing the belt. <coughs> I'm just wondering if in your, in your studies of this, if you have any tips for those of us who work in the hybrid room all day with lead uh, in terms of improving ergonomics. I didn't see anything specifically about wearing lead. But that's just another layer <laughs> that another needs to be. Another 20 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> Ted Rudowski. Uh, the last thing is robotic aging. Have been picking up robotic more Yeah. Yeah. Initially, I think when it first came out or when it was first being used more, they said it was more comfortable, but that's just because they hadn't been using it long enough for these things to sort of come into play. And you see a lot of people kind of with the chicken neck thing in, yeah. in the robot trying to see. Just like you used to see people, laparoscopy, trying to move the screen with their neck. <laughs> yeah, I still do that. Yeah. It doesn't work. I know. It doesn't work. <laughs>
I think self, as you said, self, paying attention to yourself. You know, are your knees locked? Are you standing properly? Are you feeling good? And we don't do it. We don't. And it's, it's us. Yeah, you just try to get through the case. I mean, okay. Great talk. Any other questions? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.